Thank you. I am truly honored to be here, truly honored to have the opportunity to present before you today. I want to start by giving some disclaimers. Um, I got introduced to Versa through Dr. Fred Sleek. He introduced me to Dr. Huais and some timeline on that. Um, Dr. Sleek introduced me in September of 2014. And you know how that can go. Somebody talks to you. We were, at a, we were at Top Golf in Houston, Texas. And he says, Bernie, I want to talk to you because I know you teach bone expansion techniques. So we sat down, had a conversation. And then two months later in Las Vegas, I believe it was, is where I met Salah. And I will share with you that my thoughts are now that we've had this symposium and two days of it, I think our careers and our lives have changed because I have stated that this is a game changer. And hopefully throughout my presentation, you can see while my background plays a role in seeing it very from a significant perspective as it relates to how this has changed the game. Now, we've been flying high for two days. What Salah has put together with Jessica and Dr. Slee has been tremendous. This is a phenomenal meeting. Um, I'm actually the scientific chair for a meeting. I'm the scientific chair for the AAID's national meeting in 2018, and Dr. Salah is on my committee. He made my life easy. You know what it takes to put together a meeting. I'm just going to get the stars from this dream team that he's put together, and half my work's already done. So I thank you in advance, Dr. Sam. I appreciate you for coming. And I've already talked to Dr. Gluckman about being there. His schedule is free in 2018. But let's do something here. Um, we got ahead of ourselves. All right. So I want to take, take us back a little bit. I want you to touch down. You know, I was sharing we've been flying around very high, high altitudes with Dr. Picos. It's like a jet. With, with uh, Mari Salamis, like the stealth, Jorge, so many others. And what about, what about Isaac? Wow. What a presentation, Isaac. Honored to be here to see that. So I'm going to give a perspective on my evolution and the evolution that I perceive to be true for a lot of us as it relates to instrumentation for bone in implant dentistry. We all would agree that implant dentistry is a journey. And I'm probably, I'm 26 years into my journey, and I hope I'm blessed to have 26 plus more because I love what I do. We get the opportunity each day to improve the quality of lives of the people we get to serve. Now, along that journey, we talk about people. They come to us with different sets of wants, needs, and circumstances. And those needs and wants kind of dictate our treatment in some regards. Now, this is one of the first cases I did with the Densibur, and you could appreciate that ridge is deficient. And, but I would share with you that implant dentistry, I always emphasize this, is a restorative discipline. Yes, it has a surgical component. And sometimes that component is simple. In this case with the Densibur, it's extremely simple. You get some expansion in the process of placing an implant that you otherwise might not have. But then sometimes you get cases that um, are a little bit more challenging. We consider the cases in the aesthetic zone more challenging. And what I've seen today about Ridge, Pet, and Ridge, what are you guys with the, the pres preserving the Ridge with, come on, Dr. Martin, tell me about it. Partial extraction therapy. Partial extraction therapy. There are some possibilities. This is a patient of mine who's an NBA referee, and he got hit in the mouth, going into paint by an elbow, lost his two front teeth. And uh, now with the techniques that I'm seeing you guys show, I'll be able to preserve that papilla. But the reality is we know there's no papilla there, and that's why it's deficient. Uh, for him, it's OK, but for us, it's a big concern. All right. Now this next case is a little different, all right? Um, 
and my verse was supposed to be over his eyes. But nonetheless, um, Omar got into a fight. That's his, his eye visor called Versa. Isaac got, I mean, Omar got into a fight, and obviously he lost the fight. He got hit by a pole, and that defect's pretty significant. Um, but we, which, what we want you to be able to do is look at cases like this and know that there's a solution for them. And Dr. Salama showed us some cases like that. But you want to be able to take a ridge like what you see and transfer it to something like this so it becomes a challenging procedure, surgical procedure, that can be turned into what would be classified maybe as a skillful surgical procedure. All right. There we go. So Omar's happy now. All right. We all know that bone, eloquently stated, I think the first time I heard it may have been from Dr. Garber, who is uh, Mari Salama's partner, says bone sets the tone. And then Mari's will turn around and say the tissue's the issue. But I got that from them, and we know if we can manage bone, we can have a lot of success in implant dentistry, but we do have to be, become skillful at being able to manage soft tissue as well. Now, we've got two engineers who strongly influence our profession. We all know Dr. Brandon Mark, Dr. Krauser was just talking about him. Um, he gave us the concept of osseoid integration, need I say more? And the reality is, if we have the next case, Dr. Brunsky, who was just mentioned by Dr. Krauser as well, if we have micro motion, which has been talked about a lot from the research that was presented yesterday, we will not be able to get osseo integration. So now, here's our reality. We already talked about patients coming to see us. They come to see us with different situations. And what we know today is that we have techniques, different pathways of techniques, I would will, I will classify them, where we should be able to take a case like any one of these cases and completely rehabilitate them and give them a functional smile. Now, what's our goal as modern dentists? Our goal as modern dentists is to restore our patients to normal contour, function, comfort, aesthetic speech and health, regardless of the degree of atrophy or injury or disease to the somatonathic system. Now that was a quote given to us by my mentor, my chief mentor who I've been spending about 26 years with, Dr. Hill Tatum. Now the key thing he added to this was normal health permitting. We have to be conscious of our host and our host's ability to heal, their social history, their medical history, so forth, so on, because in some respects you could do the best surgery you've ever thought you've done, but the host is not going to receive a great outcome for you because they're just not positioned to do so. Another one of my mentors who was also mentored by Dr. Tatum is Dr. Mish. Didn't think I'd be here today having a conversation about Dr. Mish. Dr. Tatum's 83. Carl was 69. I met Carl in October of 1992. And my life changed because I subsequently started training with Carl. Carl was a, is a driven giant. I mean, I, th I, I imagine in stature, Carl was about 6'4", but I would share with you, in my mind, he was about 7'1", 7 7'2". 7 and uh, he gave us so much, and I agree with Dr. Picos, the symphony that we will hear for the rest of time that echoes what we learned from Carl Misch will always be there. He was an icon. So to that end, and out of respect for Carl, I borrowed from some information that he shared with all of us, which is the thing we have to be in control of or be mindful of, which is bone. And he and Dr. Martha Badez wrote an article and they gave us some parameters to at least consider, at least to have conversations with our patients so that we can tailor our treatment accordingly. That within one year, if you've lost a tooth, you can lose 25% of the bone volume. Between one to three years, you can lose 40 to 60%. And greater than five, don't, don't be surprised if you lose 70%. Now, he also gave us these concepts, and they've been talked about. Isaac did a phenomenal job. Dr. Neva talked about them as well. Available bone and bone density. I use the teachings of Carl Misch to create my treatment plans. Let's ask ourselves a question. Where does guided surgery have application? 
in one of these divisions of bone, you can do guided surgery for the most part, where you've got enough width and you've got enough height, all right? Other than that, you get into a second division of bone, division B, which you have inadequate height. I'm sorry, you have adequate height, but you have classically considered inadequate width. And so you have to have techniques in your tool chest. You have to have technology in your tool chest or in your skill set to be able to manage these kinds of deficiencies. Then there's division C and division D bone. And then we get into what we call bone density. We have to appreciate these concepts associated with both. D1, D2 bone. This D3, D4 bone, we have a paradigm shift in how we think about it, especially with densibers, and especially with my classical training as it relates to how I use what has been talked about quite a bit, which are osteotomes. But Salah told me, he said, Bernie, you're going to stop using osteotomes. And I've shared with Salah and many, for years we've been looking for a solution to substitute for the use of osteotomes where you've got deficiency in bone. And the reality is, I think we found it with his genius as it relates to things. And that case that Professor Ziv just showed, where he had a one millimeter ridge, and he placed four implants, and he splinted them and loaded them, that was a significant paradigm shift for me because one of the conversations I've heard about Densiburs is that it's indicated in at least three millimeters of bone height, bone width. So Ziv just blew that out the water and, and changed our thinking as a race to it. Professor Ziv reminds me of Dr. Tatum. He stretches the envelope. And so one thing about having a mentor like Professor Mazur is you know how to stay on, he's here, he's here. One of the, honor, one of the realities is if you have a, a mentor like him, he pushes the envelope. And for me, what Dr. Hill Tatum does for me, he pushes the envelope. And so what I do is I study, I train, I pay close attention. But a lot of times in my private practice, I kind of stay a little bit closer to the harbor shore. Dr. Mazur, Dr. Tatum, they can go way out in the ocean, but they know how to navigate the ocean. So I share that with you as a person who's probably halfway along my journey. For those young guys in the room, look at what he does, but be mindful of the fact that he's very talented. And for him to be able to do what he did with some of the cases you saw, like he shared with you, don't go out and do that next week. It's not a Monday morning thing. So there are a lot of pathways in implant dentistry. Dr. Krauser was just showing you. He showed you one with a question mark. He showed you your train track went north and train track went south and one went east and west. Philosophically for me, I think there are different pathways to approach plate implant dentistry. Neurosab is a concept, it's an acronym that Dr. Hilt Tatum gave to what he classified to be his 50 year journey in implant dentistry. So from 1955 to 2005, he said his journey culminated in him giving a label and a title to what he believes that all of us in this room should look for when we place implants. And so what does Neurosap stand for? Natural implant restoration or restorations in stable alveolar bone. One of the things we knew from the past is we talk about grafting procedures. Do grafting procedures work? How long is that bone graft going to last? And so the concept of having stable alveolar bone is really critical. Now, their concepts or their tenets or components to Neurosab. We want you to be able to do these procedures, but we, we insist that you do these procedures under sterile conditions. That's an important reality. Bone manipulation, which is kind of what I believe has brought me here, um, is to be able to do procedures by uh, using instruments, whatever you have, to be able to place implants. And then maxillary sinus grafts or lifts, which Dr. Tatum was the first to do the sinus lift procedure um, and the sinus graft procedure. Um, we want to do it. Now, this is a concept that he's been talking about for probably 11 years now. He used to do it in the past. He's revisited it and changed it and modified it. This is what's a vascularized segmental osteotomy. How many of you are familiar with that procedure? 
I'm your new Facebook friend. I need you to accept. Okay. I got it. All right. So a vascularized segmental osteotomy is a way that we philosophically in our camp believe is the best way to correct vertical defects provided the anatomic situation and circumstance sets it up, self up to accommodate. And then doing on-lay grafts. Here's a case where you classically, the patient's lost posterior teeth, premolars and molars, has been without, been wearing a partial, and has a very deficient ridge. And I want you to understand that I'm doing a graft through a tunnel, which is my incisions here. I tunnel all the way back to the retromolar pad, and I've got a block graft that's maturing through that tunnel. What's the biggest thing we challenge ourselves with when we do grafting procedures? Maurice talked about it earlier, is managing the soft tissue, making sure we maintain closure. So one of the ways I've been able to increase my gain, increase my success with doing only graft procedures is to embrace this concept of remote incisions. Now, where necessary, when their intra-restorative space doesn't allow for us to do an only graft, and the nerve course is high, there are techniques and procedures where we, whereby we can lateralize a nerve, take the, take the nerve, move it back posterior so we can gain access to that bone and be able to restore implants and have normal dentition as it relates to the height here. All right, so those two we won't get into obviously today, but here's the reality. I believe that there's a connection between two two concepts or components of Neurosab, which are bone manipulation, which when you break up bone manipulation, it, it refers to compaction, and it refers to expansion. A lot of people call this expansion technique ridge split, okay? And the sinus lift procedures. When you talk about osteodensification, it embraces those concepts. And what I think it does is it modernizes how we can achieve these results with the procedures that we can do with the denser burrs. Now, it's been well stated. I mean, this is the reality. Shalaset is not the burr, it's the collagen. It's the plasticity, it's the viscoelasticity of that living substance that affords us the opportunity to do some of these procedures. Hilt will say, Bernie, the bone is plastic. And with the right tools, you can move the plastic around. So my reality is osteodensification and Salah, again, I thank you, have changed. And I think there's a merger between here. Now I'll say this. I have said for many years, and I've been around for a while, that Hilt Tatum is the one genius that I know. I don't know. I might have met the second one. But it, it definitely feels that way, and that's a good thing. So these two guys are significant in terms of things. Now, what are our goals? We've been talking about it. I don't need to belabor it. Bone to implant contact, we want to increase. That's going to give us an opportunity to have greater initial stabilization, have high torque strength, and have high, high osteo readings. Why do we do bone compaction? His, classically, this slide is something I've used for years. We want to change poor quality bone to better quality bone. We want to effectively place implants with, in my case, osteotomes for many years, or denser burrs with minimal to no bone removal where gaining width is not necessary. We're, we're gaining width is necessary. Why do we, oh, we're, we're gaining width is not necessary. So the concept there, a lot of conversation has been about why do we take away bone? I can share this with you. Dr. Tatum was completely opposed to taking away bone. The whole concept of taking away bone never settled with him. And so now we have others talking about that as well. So now that's compaction. With bone expansion, we want to manipulate bone and expand the bone to reverse the resorptive pattern that I show from the slide from Carl. We want to form a receptor site for an implant without any bone removal. We want to serve an efficient, we want this to serve as a efficient alternative to blocks, particularly grafting in patients who have adequate bone height but have insufficient width. And the VersaBurst system, as we have seen so much throughout this weekend, affords us that opportunity. 
We want to optimize the site and optimize the outcome. There's the collection. All right. Now, Dr. Krauser asked a question. His question was, how many in the room have Ostel readings or Ostel units? I like this concept, and he said it right on point. I want to have, when I'm in surgery or when I'm doing treatment, an objective way of making decisions. I live in Atlanta. I trained in New York. I trained in LA. One of the things that we also have to do is, if I've got a reason why I do something based on science and it's objective, I document it and it protects me. So if something happens, I say the reasons why I did so was because of my information that I got from modern technology that gives me an objective decision. A lot of times when we talk about doing immediate implants, I have this set for 45. Immediate implants, if you look at the literature, will suggest to you that you can immediately provisionalize an implant if it torques 30, 35 newton centimeters. In my world and when I teach, I say I always want to bump it up to 45. So I need more in terms of my numbers for my reverse torque. I need more with my ostels before I do certain things. I'm extremely conservative because I treat people. And people don't come to us for implants. People come to us for fixed teeth that look great, work well, and last a long time. Implants are the means by which you and I give them that goal. So now, I use osteotomes. I do sedation, so my patients are asleep. And for, in 20 plus years, I haven't had a concern. But my reality is I've always been looking for a better tool. All right? And different osteotomes do different things. I also believe all osteotomes aren't created equal. I think the energy in the shaft changes the conversation about how dramatic it'll be. But my reality is if you know how to use them, you can be very effective. But now with, with the new tool that we have that's evolutionized what we have, we're in a great shape. So this patient came to see me from New York. Her bridge was actually in her hand and she wore partial. Her concern or her request was to have, she just wanted her bridge replaced, but she said, if I can have it where I don't have to have a partial, I'm happy. So I'm gonna go through this and I'm gonna show you. So what do we have? We got a millimeter of that ridge there, maybe two. So I go through a series of osteotomes. I start here with a 15 blade and I place an implant. You can see here that I reversed that resorptive pattern. You saw how deficient it was. My issue becomes this. If I can do a block graph, get a better result, I'm gonna do a block graph. If I can't do a block graph and get a better result and I can expand the bone, that's what I'm gonna do. All right, so here's the case here. All these implants were placed. No drills were used at all. Now I can use Versaburs, Densaburs, and this case is restored. So here you have it, here's your right lateral, your left lateral, and a blunt was used to elevate the sinus with osteotomes. I used an allograft, and I was able to infracture the sinus when it was necessary there, okay? Here's the case, she's got provisionals here. Um, her restoration's in place, she's happy. Here's another case. Dr. Picos made a comment yesterday. He said, I hope nobody would try to expand that ridge. Okay. Dr. Professor Mazur showed us a case where he took osteodensification burrs, and, he, it, and I got excited. When he showed the case a moment ago when he had a millimeter on one side and he had a little bit more um, he said two, it was a little less than two, and he put those implants in, I got excited. But here's a case where I, before I didn't have an instrument that could accommodate me to accomplish this, and so what you see me is going through a series of instruments to be able to place this implant. Now it measures two, two four with the tissue, but when you look at it in cross section, you see it's 1.6. And if you look at it in the volumetric rendering from my, at that time, Kodak, CT, you can see that's a deficient ridge. So here's the case with the implant in place. That's some two hours later, we did a phrenectomy procedure. Typically I don't do incisions when I do this, that may be some key to the magic of what's happening there. We're doing this through tissue, we've got periosteal sling supporting us, 
But I've been doing this since September the 11th of 1996. And I've got that same case that I did with congenitally missing laterals still in place and in function now. This case is about 10 years old. So you have a case here. I'll go back only because I want to show you. Look at the festooning effect of how we did this. This is a specific type of implant that Hilt Tatum makes, which has a uneven shape. It's shaped like a D, so they call it the D implant. The D implant's there. We close the base of the nose. The implant's in place. There's a restoration in place. She's been happy. Uh, again, that's about nine years in function. I haven't seen any change in the soft tissue. I thought about having her text me a picture so I can show that, but I didn't get a chance. Here we have cross section. We've got an implant that's stable, very strong. Now, I didn't do bone expansion in the mandible until 2007. And this ridge was efficient. It was a little under three, but I used this series of instruments to place these implants. There the implants are in place. Here you can see how we got a festooning effect by using the instruments with skill to be able to accomplish it. One of the things that Hilt would say about the components of Neurosab is the hardest thing that I teach Bernie is bone expansion. He said the other skills that I teach are easier than bone expansion, but what we consider ourselves to be doing is romancing the bone, becoming one with the bone. I appreciate Dr. Neva's comment about the denser burrs. There is a learning curve associated with the denser burrs. You know, it's not as simple. You've looked at several slides that have shown a picture of forward one with the pilot and everything else in reverse. But then Dr. Neva graced the stage, gave us an excellent presentation, and shared with you that 80% of the time, I'm in cutting mode going forward. Only 20% of the time am I in reverse. The hepatic effect, Isaac talked about it as well. You get the sense in the feel. So for me now, and I have been playing with these birds more recently, you can, there's a sense of understanding that has to happen with your hands, your eyes, your arm, your brain about when to go in one direction. It's not just foolproof as it relates to how to do this. But at any rate, there's that case restored. And that's been in function for probably some 10, 15 years. I'm sorry, that's not true. 2011, August. Now, I was looking for a better tool, a different tool. I've been exposed to these other rotary instruments, and I'm going to buzz through this. Um, so we've got a lot of them on the market. Meisinger makes one. BTI makes one. And what I can share with you, this is from uh, Dr. Salah and, and Dr. Sleet's article, there, I found in my hands that I couldn't have control. So I had more control with osteotomes in achieving my goals than what I had with these. And so that was not the panacea, that wasn't the solution to my concern by trying to get away from it. Now, I did a presentation in Chicago, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but I wrote this on the slide because I felt like Versa changed the game. I think there's going to be an evolutionary shift and I'm happy to be a part of it. So this is from the, the website for Versa. We're compacting and condensing bone. You've been through all this. We're enhancing bone, so we're accelerating bone healing. We're increasing residual strain. So we're enhancing osteogenic activity, which in, again is in accelerating bone healing. We're increasing implant stability, which Brunsky shared with us. If you can increase stability and have no micromotion, you can get integration. If you can get integration, you can restore cases. If you can restore cases faster, we're going to make a lot of pe more people happier because our reality is, just like Dr. Isaac said, and I appreciate his presentation and the gentleman before him, I want to be able to restore it in one day. I want to be able to restore it in one week. I just haven't been comfortable with it because the science suggests in some respects that I need to be patient and wait. So there's a lot of support for this now. That's what's nice about our evolutionary or our revolution of DENSA. But let me share with you this. This is the 2014 meeting that I met Salah. Dr. Johnson did a poster clinic a poster session at the AID annual meeting. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she won the poster session. Um, normally I judge those, but I wasn't that year. But Versa 
it's changing the game. All right, it's allowing us to expand ridges. It's gonna be more cost effective for us to treat our patients. It's gonna allow us to reduce treatment times, which is really exciting for me. Conserving precious bone cells and restoring labial contours. Now, I'm the guy who sits on the sidelines and lets, I live in Atlanta, so I've got the benefit of Team Atlanta being in my backyard. They are seven miles from me. They push the envelope for me in Atlanta, and so what I try to do is I allow them to go out in front, Dr. Sam. If something changes, about 18 months, they pull back. Well, guess what? I never got in the water. So I'm a solo practitioner. Uh, my parents are both educators, and uh, I work hard every day, like I guess Dr. Krause was suggesting that he does, but I really don't believe he does. <laughs> um, and I said, how do I get involved with Densibur, get information quantitatively so that I can have comfort in doing it, and as a part of what I do as an educator, Dr. Klepper, I feel strong behind it. You've been there. When somebody shared with you, something's gonna work, it's gonna be great, it says it's gonna cost you $10,000, you do it, and then eight months later they take it off the market. We can't afford to do that. You young guys in the room, here's the reality. We have what we would classify to be, you've ever heard this concept, there was called first adopters and then the first followers? You've heard that concept? I think these, this dream team, these guys, we're fortunate to have them, all right? The dream team are the first adopters. They took on this concept, Salah convinced them, they embraced it. I'm with you guys, I'm one of the first followers. So I haven't done a lot of cases, I have had my share, um, but how did I decide I'd get involved with this? My strategy was simple. I do some all on six cases. So this patient came to me from Miami, she'd had two sets of implants placed, and they both failed. And her husband hands me the check for the services and says, are you sure you can do this? And I'm like, do what? What are you talking about? He says, well, you, and she didn't tell me that, he tells me. He says, she has had this done twice, six sets, two sets, six implants, and they all failed. I learned this when I'm about to go in and go into surgery. So I do what's called a CT directed. I like what Dr. Krauser was suggesting. CT directed, so it's true, true CT guided surgery is where the implant goes through the guide. CT directed surgery, as I call it, is when you create a guide, but you, you line it up where the pilot goes through the guide, and maybe the first burr in succession. After that, you're doing freehand implant dentistry. And this works well if you're using Densa, because Densa needs that open buckle or labial window so that you can use the burr accordingly. So here are my implants in place, and at so I'm using a combination. So I say, how do I get involved with Densa? Stay safe, stay close to the harbor shore, but yet experience this technology. So these implants were placed with the BioHorizons drills, okay? These were placed with Versa. So it gave me an objective way. I love Dr. Professor Mazur's uh, ortho chain to be able to put my Com my composite, as he said. But I'm gonna use these ISQ values. So here are my A, B, and C. A, B, and C are the, in the patient's right side. D, E, and F are the patient's left side. Look at my numbers. My numbers are higher on the left side. I'm feeling better about those, okay? So I go through my process, and this is at, so my protocol is a stage technique. Eight to 10 weeks is when I capture my impression, which is when I'm going back in and taking a new Ostel reading. So I've got a series of cases I'll show. I capture your impression, that's a part of the guide. I've modified it. There's the impression, we section it, we didn't relude it back together, and we capture, which is a, a, an impression which to afford us the opportunity to make this hybrid prosthesis. Um, in this patient, that's been in function for some I guess about 12, 13 months now, and I'm pleased with the results and she's pleased. Now, the burrs, 
this conversation here, you got to get a sense and a feel. You got to be able to intuitively relate to your density of bone and make decisions chair side clinically. So I guess my conversation with a lot of doctors are, you still got to be a surgeon and you still got to work to develop skills so that you can have success because everything doesn't go well sometimes in surgery. All right. So here's a case that came to me. We identified this case. He had advanced perio. So here are my torque, torque readings on the le right side, your left. Here are my torque readings on the right side. And this is greater than 60 newtons. This is greater than 45, greater than 45, greater than 45. So my torque wrench measures in five newton centimeter increments. Okay. My osteo readings on the left side were as outlined. My osteo readings on the right side were as outlined. So now, I'm getting information that objectively is giving me a sense of confidence with the, the, the burr and what it can do and what it's claiming to do from a densification standpoint because it's giving me higher osteo readings. I don't get a sense that I was doing anything different right, right side to left side from a surgical standpoint. So, and then at eight weeks, my numbers came up a little bit, but my numbers on the right side maintained themselves or even bumped up as well. On the posterior, which is where you lose a lot of the, you may lose some of the implants because it's a little softer back there, the number went down. It didn't prevent me from restoring the case. Here's the case in, and that gentleman's pleased as well. All right. Next case, similar conversation. All right. But this time I said, I'm just going to use these denser burrs. I've got enough information now. I feel comfortable with the diversion between the two sides that I'm doing better with I still didn't do standard drilling. And so here are my numbers here, okay? And you can see now I'm in a situation where I've gotten high osteo readings. So the conversation about immediate load is coming into my mind now as a possibility. I still didn't do it because I'm very conservative. In 10 weeks or 12 weeks, you've been a dentalist for how long? I need you to give me three more months. That's my conversation with my patient. So here I am here, case four. Um, Tommy's a great guy. He was very pleased. This case, advanced perio, um, pretty much compromised dentition throughout. Um, same concept, same process. I did a little bump here with the Versa Burrs. Here's my first experience with that. Now I'm doing a situation where I'm going into the sinus instead of me using a blunt osteotome or instead of me using a lot of different options as it relates to how you can do that. I'm using Versa, and the thing I was enamored with is when you go in and probe and you sound and you know you're beyond your, meeting, your reading, you got seven millimeters and you're probing and you're hitting bone, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, this is a good day. Because all I did in this case was put my handpiece in reverse and advance very lightly and very gently and watch this autograph process take place, that's a magical moment because we've all been there with sinus lift procedures where you can't see and you're trying to advance an osteotome or whatever technique, whether it be the Hyacinth casket kit, the HPISE kit, doesn't matter. The DOS kit, I got them all. The reality is this has made it so much easier and that's why I gave it the title of the Game Changer back then, but I don't, I'm not alone. So here are my readings here and we got a lot better as it relates to things. Nice smile, fixed dentition. That's what I think patients want. They want fixed solutions. And that's what I like to think that I do for patients. Having said that, if I need to do over dentures because that's what they can afford because of their circumstance, I'm happy to do that too. I want to be able to preserve bone and placing implants stabilizes bone. So here's another case. Patient came to me. He's got significant perio. Now, I got a situation here where I lost an implant and I had to do a rescue. So that implant, I subsequently came in and retrofitted it to the system, but I did lose that implant. But look at my readings. I knew going in, I was compromised or more so than the other implants and ultimately about eight weeks. So it was an early failure, if you will, and I lost it there. Look at my reverse torque. So I had information objectively that knew. I was able to share that with the patient. We moved forward from there. We still loaded the case. It became all on five for a period of time. Now it is all on six, okay, or it will be. So there's that case there in place. This last case here of this series, 
I've got a case here where I said, okay, everybody wants stuff tomorrow. They want it fixed, they want it loaded. I agree with Dr. Krauser. He says, as long as he gets cross arc stabilization, it's fine. I say, I can get cross arc stabilization in three months, I'm fine. This patient had a significant gag reflex, so it kind of challenged me relative to being able to have her agree with me to wear a denture for two to three months. Nonetheless, here's an x-ray of my guide. I got my implants in place here. I got high ISQ values, and at eight weeks, they maintain themselves, maybe even bumped up, as Dr. Rosen said. So I go through a process, do a pickup. You see this, I guess you could call it a conversion. I've got my material in place here. I then subsequently relieve, re eliminate the palate and put that case in. And so she went from where you saw her to there, quite pleased, a big difference from what she came in with, um, a great service in my regards. Now, so I go from doing maxillary cases where I got the opportunity for cross arch stabilization with Densibur. I think that's a, I'm putting my foot in the water. Now I go from there and I said, okay, historically Carl told me you're better off placing implants in a mandible and you're gonna have success with that. So this case here, uh, I'm using dents in the mandible. Mm, kind of thin ridge, look at how it expanded there. You see this here? I expand that there, put in an implant. I gotta speed it up here a little bit. I put in a 5.7 and I think that ridge might have been three at the crest. So I pushed the envelope there, but I'm used to doing it in some regards with osteotomes, so I'm comfortable. I get osteo readings, I appreciate the conversation I think Isaac shared with us. You get readings in two different areas. Dr. Rosen yesterday said it as well. Um, and you do need that information. It was a screw retained, limited inner arch space, um, so you don't have a lot there as a relates thing. This case here, uh, teeth in position, um, compromise, eliminated those teeth, did an allograft, placed a cytoplasm membrane that I take out in about 21 days, uh, got my ridge there, placed this implant, and here's my implant at three months, and I'm restoring this implant, and there's a restoration probably the day we put it in position. I showed you this case, placed an implant with the densification burrs, got expansion on that ridge there, you can see that there, um, and got my restoration in place. Now, some maxillary cases. Here's a case here. Um, just restored this case, my implant's in place there. I got a 45 Newton centimeter, 61, feeling good about that. I waited, I wait five, five months in the maxilla typically. Now what I'm hearing is based on this science and this technology, which was well documented over the last day and a half, uh, I can go back in in six weeks. Is that what you guys are saying? Six weeks? I'm excited about that. I just kind of want my early adopters to go out first a little longer, and then I'll be in position to take on it. All right? So here's a restoration in place. Another case, and I'm just going to kind of walk through these pretty quickly because my time is short. Um, implant in place there. I got a video showing me placing them, but you know the concept. You've seen it. Implant here. There we have it. That one hasn't been restored yet. Now, maxillas that include sinus involvement. Here's my flow chart that I got from Carl that I've been doing for years and teaching for years. If, if I've got greater than 10 millimeters, I place my implant. If I have six to 10, I heard that number drop down to five. Um, Professor Mazur showed us where he could do it at two and three with the protocol three. That's impressive. Implants, sinus lifts, and then in Tatum's approach, if you have less than six millimeters, we always did a lateral wall. Um, so I, for years, and I gave, I share with you, Dr. Tatum invented this procedure in the 70s. He made his first set of instruments in 1979. Um, so he taught me the lateral wall technique. He was my assistant when I learned how to do it. Um, there's a, a ridge that has no bone on. Now maybe Dr. Major can do it there too. That looks like about one, all right? But uh, I've got a sinus graft in position here, subsequently placed some implants, and restored this case. And that case has been in position for some maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, but that's where it was before. Here it is clinically. Um, and there are my restorations in place. Uh, Summers, 
Got to give credit where credit's due. I love to honor those who've gone before us. We stand on their shoulders. They give us the opportunity to do what we do to take care of our patients. 1993, he developed that Summers Osteotome technique, and uh, we went from there. Now, quickly here, um, in April of 20, for, uh, 2015, Dr. Ed Kuzak, Dr. Kuzak's um, sitting in the room here, he organized a tremendous meeting. He had us debate options as it relates to different controversies in implant treatment planning. And the controversy that I was given to, do, to discuss and give my position on was sinus lift procedures. And my counterpart, my good friend from uh, Nashville now, Dr. Bill Aconte, was asked to talk about short implants. I appreciate what Dr. Salama said as he graced the stage today. He shared with me something that I'm going to show you. And but what he said was, I have not had a lot of success with short implants. Maybe, and he said it this way exactly, I had early success, but then things changed. So my thoughts on the opportunity that Dr. Kuzak gave me to talk about sinus procedures in the posterior maxilla was, why would I put a short implant when we have so many different ways of grafting the sinus? Now we have one more that's extremely predictable with development of a skill set to be able to use these denser burrs. Uh, my Mari, she introduced me, she talked about my family, my son's 16. One of the things we love to do is watch sports together. He plays football. Uh, I'm an SC grad. For those of, I heard a conversation about Georgia and Florida. Um, SC's back, guys. So if you didn't win the national championship of big, against Alabama and Clemson, forget about it. All right, just so you know. Okay, but one of the things we like to do is watch football together. And you know on DirecTV, you got this sports channel where you got all these options. Well, I like to go to the college football channel. And uh, so what I thought in produ producing this presentation for Dr. Kuzak's program was let me create the sinus mix. Because there's so many ways we can predictably elevate the sinus and get predictable results. Why would I put a short implant? To my chagrin, there were a lot of guys who were placing short implants, um, Bicon implants or something like that. And I know Bicon's work. But here's a story where I'm actually using Versa. I've gone and extracted these juvenile periodontal, periodontally involved teeth. I've got a situation here where I've got a residual ridge that's less than 10, but close. And then I got a ridge that's far less. And so what you'll see me do here is use Densa and I placed my implants. I got the, the, the right side technically on the screen, the left side, to engage the sinus floor, and I've got the right side, the left side on the screen, to go into the sinus with Densa. And my reality is the results of that were great because it was just a matter of reversing the sinus and doing the auto lift. So I'm going to go through this quickly here. I'll show you. That's that same case restored. Next case. Similar situation, 6.35, so it falls within my criteria. If you look at it on a CT and you plan an implant and you, put, you flip it to a sinus mode, you can see where the implant goes through, have a conversation with the patient, she has to have a different procedure. I did this live in one of the courses that I teach with the Densa burrs, placed the implant with Densa. You can see that bulge right there represents where I actually elevated that sinus with the Densa burrs. So I'm I'm getting a little further out of the harbor shore now with some of the things I'm doing with Densa, and I'm getting comfortable to the degree that I feel comfortable teaching about it. And you can see it here where we got that elevation. All right, so there that case is in place. All righty. All right. So here we have it. Okay. And I wanted to show you my Ostel reading of 63. Another case, um, patient came in temporary on the posterior tooth a fractured tooth. This case was sent to me by a colleague of mine who's a prosthodontist in the city. I grafted the area. I waited six months for, I mean, sorry, 12 weeks for healing. I placed my implant here, restored this case. And there that restoration is. This case was referred to me from a colleague. He actually does the restorative on it. But I used Densa to, to place these three implants as well as lift that sinus there. And very pleased with that. Um, he put the components in place there. That's his bridge in place. And so that case, most recently done, uh, has been in function for maybe less than a month. 
here we have it here, again, using Densa, elevating, putting a second implant. So I put two implants in now to be able to accomplish that. Now, here's my conversation, and I'm going to close, Dr. Sleet, in, in essence of time. In the sports mix, we sit down, my son and I, Drew. I like to go to college football. Which site do you think he likes to go to? He's 16. He thinks he's invincible. He likes to go here. And here's my thoughts when I think about short implants in the posterior maxilla. And this tied directly in with what Dr. Mari Salama said today. You have early success, phenomenal. And then seven or eight years out, you crash and burn. All right, so versus giving us an opportunity in conclusion to be able to not try to do short implants in the posterior maxilla in addition to other things. Um, I actually, in November, which was my second year being exposed, I say what I do now is I don't use the drills that accompany my kits, none of them. I use the drivers, but I use my Versaburs to place my implants. I want to thank you for your time.